by 2035, they want 65% of the vehicles to be EVs that are, that are being purchased. If that, if that happens, just British Columbia alone would require four or five more Site C dams to provide the power. You know, it, it, it is apparent that the governments of the world right now have decided that electric vehicles are the be-all and end-all. And, and, and that's going to save us, right? But how are you going to provide all the power for those vehicles, right? And, and I find it odd, actually, that, that they haven't picked two or three technologies to, to compete for that space. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Wolf of Young Street podcast. I'm your host, Victor. This week, my guest is Mike Waterman. He's a serial entrepreneur. And you guys will find out what that truly means today because man's got businesses everywhere. He's got his fingers <laughs> in every pie you can think about. Well, welcome to the show, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. I appreciate it. Yeah, so why don't, I, I struggle to kind of describe what you do just because of the breadth of things. So how about you help us out with that? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with, with the, you know, the beginning uh, you know, I opened up a company called Renegade Electric Supply, and, and that was my first foray into uh, becoming an entrepreneur. I started that company about 10 years ago. During during that company, I started another company, which is a manufacturing company called Low Chair Technologies, and it, it sort of fits in the electrical space as well uh, with, with my electrical wholesale company. And then, you know, a few years later, I happened to be out uh, buying a cigar, and I asked my, uh, my tobacconist if he'd ever considered selling his business. And... Um, and he got all excited and uh, uh, off the process went. So, so you know, that's that's sort of the the, the, the those are the three uh, the three companies that that I'm involved with right now. Right. So, what I, I'm actually curious about your background here because it's like, okay, you don't just happen to be like, okay, I'm going to buy an <laughs> buy an electric uh, electric supplies manufacturing company and and do all these things. I mean, I, I get your interest in, in the cigars. I mean, cigars, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I grew up with a, you know, in, in, a, in a great family unit. My, my mother and my father always told me, you know, that the secret to, to success in life is, you know, uh, go to school, get good grades, uh, get a good job with good pay and good benefits, work hard, and save your money mm-hmm. and retire. And, and, you know, that, that was their recipe for success based on, on, based on their experiences in life and, and their results. I, I, my wife and I are have, um, heavily involved in the personal development field. And so I ended up doing some personal development work. And during that work, I recognized that, that my parents' path to prosperity wasn't my path. And I, I realized that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a business owner. I wanted to, to have control over, over my destiny, basically. That's kind of how, that's kind of how this, you know, the, the first company started was from that thought. Right. So, um, and, 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 so did you, you don't have any education relating to like that kind of stuff or nope. to any of the companies? Wow. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I came across the electrical wholesale business because my father was in it oh, and he was he, he was at a high level of management. And uh, I, I we ended up moving from from uh, Tawasson in the lower mainland out to uh, Ontario outside of Toronto. I, I decided you know, I think I was 17 years old when we left. I decided oh, I'll, I'll get a job for a year and then I'll go back to school. And, uh, you know, based on on, you know, my parents advice it's you know get a good job with good pay i ended up getting a job and working for a year and 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 moving through the company and and getting promotions a couple of promotions and i thought oh i'm gonna keep going at this and so that's kind of how i ended up in that business right so so let's talk about like getting started with uh renegade electric supplies there and and, Mm -hmm. and maybe describe for us what the company does uh first sure uh, sure how kind of that set up um, how you ended up setting up that company 10 years ago now i guess actually 11 years ago um when i had the idea that i wanted to to you know be a business owner and, and start a company uh, i was you know considering what i wanted to do and 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 i had 27 years in electrical wholesaling i had been in that business for a very long time so it was it was um it was familiar to me, 
and not necessarily a passion. My passion was to be an entrepreneur, was to be a business owner. Uh, and, and it just so happened that I knew electrical wholesaling. And so uh, my ex-partner and I, we, we decided to go out on our own and, and, and start an electrical wholesale company. The company was and, and still is more uh, uh, commercially focused company. We, we focus on in, in new commercial construction. Primarily is, is our marketplace. We do uh, small, medium, and large projects. We do uh, institutional projects. But the company has been set up to, to, to service that commercial market. That, that's where we go. That's, that's our, our focus. Right. So, I mean, d during my research, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I saw that you guys um, kind of service companies like, you know, Hammond Power and, and ABB. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so Hammond Power and ABB. Uh, those would be a couple of our large manufacturer vendors. So they're, they're our vendor partners. We, we basically um, take those manufacturers, put them together into a, a proposal or, or a, a bid package, uh, and then present that to our, our electrical contractors who are, are our typical market. That, that's who we focus on, the commercial electrical guys. Right. So a lot of people are not very familiar with that commercial electrical space when we kind of visualize like our our power supply we think of it as a government controlled uh thing but we don't actually maybe clarify for us where you where you fit in where sort of the market gap that your company is filling so you know any major commercial type project that you see there's there's a lot of uh, tilt up industrial that, that goes on everywhere in, in, in the world. Certainly in the, in the lower mainland of Vancouver, there's, you know, tilt up commercial properties, what they call them. Um, office buildings are, are another, another uh, um, market we get involved with. Some light industrial stuff where we're, we're involved in some, some mine uh, operational facilities in, in British Columbia as well. We, we, we don't do, we don't do residential. We don't really do, um, uh, like like condom, condominium towers, that's not a, a strength for us. I, that's that's a residential pro, uh, type project. So the single family homes, the townhomes, the high rise stuff, we, we we don't focus on that. We we we've decided to be be pretty pinpoint focused on the market that we want to go after, rather than being uh, a generalist, let's say, in the market. So. Uh, that this does kind of with with this kind of business that you do it gives it gives you a unique perspective into the the drive for renewable energy and just in terms of the adaptation of the of the power grid as it is right now towards a more sustainable version so how do you how have you seen like um the like power generation change obviously you've been at this what over ten years now. Right. How have you seen the power grid kind of shift um, and sort of electricity supply shift from when you started to it now? You know, it, it hasn't really changed. I think, you know, in, in certainly in British Columbia, we still build, you know, hydroelectric dams. Uh, that's that's the principal um, power source, right, that, that, that we use in, in British Columbia. You know, the the one thing that that always that still confuses me in this business is with the adoption of, of EVs and, and how many people are buying them uh, and the amount of, amount of power that they draw uh, on, on the, the grid, the power grid, it's staggering. 20, by 2035, they want 65% of the vehicles to be EVs that are, that are being purchased. If that, if that happens, what, from the information that I've read, just British Columbia alone would require four or five more Site C dams to provide the power. Yeah, it's crazy. And so you know, I'm, I'm extremely confused because, I, you know, all of these EVs, um, it's fantastic. And, you know, when you're buying EVs, you have to build the infrastructure to, to support them and, and provide power to them. I just don't understand where that power can be coming from. And, and, and in an area like British Columbia, uh, solar isn't, isn't great. Uh, you know, it does provide power, but it's not great. Uh, wind is, is okay. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't see those right now being that stopgap and 
and, and coming in to provide all that extra power because the amount of the amount of electricity uh, that, that that those cars uh, require is is phenomenal. Right. So, and, and and that's and that's really where I want to uh, because a lot of people maybe don't realize that your EV is only as clean as the power supply is, right? Yeah. And yeah. And that's potentially a pitfall in this kind of full electrification kind of drive that we have right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. With that said, a controversial source of power that that people have often kind of like, yeah, should we or should we not is is nuclear power. Mm-hmm. And what is your opinion of the future of nuclear power and kind of solving that, you know, dense energy supply problem? Uh, I think I think that's. Maybe in, in the near term, the solution until until technology catches up with maybe some extra, you know, some, some solar technology or or, or um, power storage technology or, or ocean technology. I, I think that we're going to need something to, to to come on online to provide enough power. Um, so so I think uh, you know s- smaller like micro nuclear might be a uh, might be a really cool option i think it's fairly safe it's truly um true clean energy it doesn't have any emissions whatsoever right so i mean it it is nuclear and and you know there is an opportunity for for a disaster to happen i guess is is probably how people feel about it yeah. you know i i think that the disasters that have happened in the world maybe other than you know japan with with uh, the the earthquake there, yeah, but the earthquake that 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 helped to spill a bunch of uh, radioactive stuff into the ocean, right? You know, other than that, you know, you look at like a Chernobyl. I think that place, you know, that facility was probably mismanaged and not maintained the way it needed to be, right? And so, uh, you know, with I think that 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 nuclear technology has uh, probably uh, yeah. grown. And, and and gotten much safer. Right? You know, there's lots of com- countries. That I think France has a huge amount of of nuclear reactors. China does. You know, there's lots of countries that have reactors that they don't have any problems. Yeah, but a, a, a lot of people would argue for okay, but the waste though. You know, we're not truly yeah. getting rid of the waste. Yeah. What we're doing is is burying yeah. that, right? And you know, what is the potential impact of that down the line, or in, in case of earthquakes, yeah. or if the if, if if you're in a particularly uh, earthquake prone zone like like Japan, well, surely you don't want to be having you don't want to be burying nuclear waste <laughs> in the ground, right? Because of no, no. Yeah. So yeah, carry on. So there's lots of uh, areas in in the world where people, you know, it's not inhabitable. You could probably go, to, you know, to a place in the in the desert in the states and dig hole, and and nothing would ever. Uh, get in the way or or, or or cause any challenges, right? I mean, there's lots of remote areas in the world. I think we could store that material, and 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 I'm sure that engineers are smart enough to to create uh, containment systems that that you know could withstand anything. I have to imagine. That's actually an interesting solution that I that I haven't thought about, like like uh, burying nuclear waste in remote areas. The, the the truth is, is that as humans, we need power. So how do we do it? You know, do do we restrict the movement of people in order for them to not use so much power? Do we restrict how people can travel in vehicles? Do we? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, how do you manage all that energy uh, and the demand from the people? It's 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 a weird one. It, that that baffles me. Uh, I'm interested to see how uh, how the governments of the world uh, tackle this issue because there's. You know, it, it, it is apparent that the governments of the world right now have decided that electric vehicles are the be-all and end-all. Right. And, and, and that's going to save us, right? And so, okay, and, uh, you know, that's fine, but how are you going to provide all the power for those vehicles and let people move about, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I find it odd, actually, that, that um, you know, they haven't picked two or three technologies to, to compete for that space. You know, hydrogen uh, is is still there. It's been there. I think Ballard Power has been around for what fifty years or something. Yeah, that that technology has been around, but it doesn't seem like it really is going anywhere. And there's not a lot of investment in that technology. I, I, I firmly believe that you know it's it's best to have competing technologies to go after a goal. 
right? It, it, I think it, it, it helps each one of them spur on and push the other to new innovations, right? I think, you know, uh, that, that, I mean, that, that's just my thought on it anyway. Obviously, the big issues that people have with hydrogen, uh, like fuel cell type systems, mm. well, is you then need to engineer things like, you know, how to store the hydrogen without it blowing up in, in your car, right? Do you really yeah. want to drive around with like an explosive <laughs> in your engine? Well, I mean, we do though right now. I mean, even if you look like a gasoline car, if, if you get into a bad enough accident, it's going to explode. You know, we've seen, we've seen um, that, that the battery technology in some of these cars is, is, you know, causing problems in cars and airplanes and, you know, they're having fires and stuff. So uh, I don't know if it's that much different. I, again, I'm sure that the engineers of the world could figure out a solution, uh, a safe solution for people to, to store hydrogen, you know, in, in their vehicles. Uh, there must be. You know. There's a lot of smart people in the, wor in the world, and I think somebody can figure that out. Beyond, beyond obviously, uh, nuclear power, which is a big controversial one, yep. um, which other technology would you say has, like, as like um, great potential, similar potential compared to nuclear. Just my first thoughts on that is is probably uh, ocean current, ocean ocean currents or or wave generation. You know the ocean doesn't stop much at all. It's always moving. Oh, it's it's always flowing somewhere. It's not always wavy. It's not always wavy, but it it, it is always flowing. And so you know there 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 must be something there that that we can capture to help uh, provide some energy for us that that's my first thought on it you know wind sure i think i think you know bird lovers would would prefer not to see wind farms uh, <laughs> you know because birds do get killed by them but um yeah it, I, does, I, I, yeah it does really ruin the landscape a little bit right yeah it sure does yeah i was flying over uh, flying from toronto back to vancouver a couple weeks ago and and we went over an area, I think, in southern Alberta that had a bunch of wind farms, and they just don't look very nice, you know. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> so, um, in terms of, uh, back to the kind of power supplies now, how, how have you had to adapt, like, home electrical installation, especially now that we're trying to build this? Uh, because the big problem with alternative energy is, is storage, right? And there's this always there's always been this idea floating around about like about grid to car and kind of car to, to grid kind of system. And how how does that change? Does that does that even change significantly how you wire a building um, to be able to adapt to that kind of requirement? You know, like a, an EV charger is just a, another device, right? It, it's just like a, a plug in your wall. It's it's like a, a switch on the wall. It's it's the exact same. Well, let's, let's call it a plug in the wall. That's all it is. You know, people think, oh, God, an EV charger, it's, it's pretty, pretty technical. It's just a device that goes on the wall. So, you know, to answer your question directly, they are, uh, the only thing that you would add is you, you, would, you would size your, your, um, your incoming hydro service. You would size it so that it could manage and handle an uh, extra load, which is the EV charger. Uh, and then the, they are required by the I think the National Building Code to to build that circuit into like the garage and put a uh, put a, a plug outside in the garage. That's a 40 amp plug that that you can plug an EV charger into. So that's the only real changes. That's the only real changes I think that we've seen in uh, um, you know. To accommodate for EVs, right? So I guess what I'm trying to understand there is, well, we're used to plugging stuff to get the power out, but you know, when you're trying to kind of put the power in, sort of like car to grid, do you have to? As far as I know, you're not just able to just plug it into the wall in the same way and do a reverse thing. I, I don't. I don't think you can now. I'm. I'm not completely uh, familiar with all of that stuff, but I, I don't believe that you can actually uh, feed the grid with, with the battery. I don't think that technology is available yet um, or the peop that hydro allows it. Uh, you, can, you can back feed the hydro grid using solar panels or wind uh, because that, that power is basically um, wired into your, your breaker panel and that 
as you generate power, it would push it back into the grid and, and drop your 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 meter, right. wind your meter down. Yeah, but the car, I, I don't, I I'm not familiar with any systems that that you know they push. Uh, the cars will push the power back to the to the grid or the home. That's actually one one of my companies, um, a load share technologies. Because we we build we build a load sharing device for that industry where. Where uh, if, if a homeowner has um, a, an electrical service that that won't accommodate a 40 amp charger, there's really two options. Um, you have to take the whole breaker panel out. You have to bring a, a new hydro service in that that increases your the power available to your home. Uh, it, it's a huge construction project. The panel comes out and, and everything gets torn out and, and replaced. Um, there's that option, uh, or uh, our, our device, uh, which which um, shares power between your your stove and the car charger, so you don't need to go through that process of of, of you know it, it's it's like a two thousand dollar fix instead of a ten thousand dollar fix. I see. Yeah. Okay. And 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 that in that company we're uh, I'm starting to look at energy storage as well <clears throat> to match with that so that um, you know we can have a a bank of batteries in a garage that that um, you know the the batteries will work with the power with the hydro uh, and then manage <clears throat> manage how you're charging your car and when actually let's talk, so uh, since you started talking about load share there let's let's talk about load share <laughs> yeah um, uh, I, I want you to so you you describe um, almost like shifting the load in order to accommodate your ev charger is my understanding of your description of of yeah. load shares technology there so how does that work do you just you have a device um like some sort of circuit breaker within the house that shuts off supply to a certain part and then kind of like turns on the flips on the other parts and, and kind of for that moment is directed towards a, your 40 amp for, for your EV. Is that, is that the kind of device that you've built? That sort of. Yeah, sort of. <clears throat> so I, when I was designing uh, that, that product, there was, there was another product that was out in the marketplace that, that did it a little differently. And I, and I thought there was an easier way to do it, a simpler way. And simp, you know, simply said, uh, we basically mount our, our, the unit's called a divvy, and you mount that box, you know, beside the panel or wherever you want to, right? And uh, and, and you bring the the power feed for your stove through the divvy and back to the stove, and so your stove is always powered, right? So your stove never turns off; it, it always has power. And there's a, a contactor in uh, in the divvy unit that uh, that and, and a sensor that senses if the stove comes on, it shuts the charger off. If when the stove comes, when the stove turns off, the unit will wait for 15 minutes and turn your charger back on again. So they're both sharing one circuit breaker in in your panel, um, and only one of them can be working at any one time. I see. So what are what 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 kind of um, obviously a circuit breaker in itself is a safety it's a safety mm -hmm. stop, but mm -hmm. uh, are, are there any kind of regulatory hoops that you have to draw and jump through to make that uh, happen? So, I mean, I, I'm i not an engineer by trade. I'm, I like to joke, I'm a parts guy. Sold electrical, <laughs> I've sold electrical parts for 38 years now or something like that, right? Yeah. But I but I, I have an analytical mind and, and, and I can see, um, I can visualize how things will work, right, uh, when they're connected. And so I basically started to design and put parts together and figure it out, uh, tested it in my in my office, and it worked the way that I thought it should work. And and so I I started the, the started down the path of of getting it uh, approved by the electrical authorities, right? Which is typically they people call it CSA approval. CSA is just a company that approves, right? That crew, uh, approves products to the to the electrical standards, right? So, so we had it CSA approved, and uh, that was that was probably a three four month process. And I, at the same time, I applied for our patent um, for the design of, of my 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 divvy. And so, um, you know, that process, the patent process, took probably a year and two years almost. 
to get the, the Canadian and the North American patents done. You know, that, that's kind of what I did is, is I built it. It worked. Uh, we got it approved. We started to sell it, and we got a patent for it. And that was it. Now, it made me remember, I interviewed a guy a while ago. He's, he's an inventor. He invented an invisibility cloak, which is applied in, like, you know, uh, uh, military combo tech and stuff like that. And he, he, he said to me, well, he didn't go to school for physics or anything like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it, as you were speaking there, it was like, well, I'm hearing the exact same story with you as well. But I wonder if you had the same yeah. problems in terms of when you brought up this, I can call it an invention, uh, this 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 uh, thing that you created, did you get people kind of pushing back going, you're not an engineer, you're not an electrician, as far as we know, you're a, you're a parts guy. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, doing? you, you know, I, I've, I've had that comment maybe once uh, I was talking to a gentleman and he was asking me questions about it and, and, and he said, so, so you're an engineer. I said, no, I'm not an engineer. No. He said, what? He was an electrical engineer. He's like, what do you mean you're not an engineer? You, you designed this and you're not an engineer. I said, yeah, no, it, it's simple. I, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't discredit education one bit. Well, if you want to be an engineer, you need it. If you want to be a doctor, you need it. If you want to be a lawyer, you need it. I think for, for what I created and what a lot of things in the world can be or that are created, uh, they're created by people with just simple visions and a desire to, to do it. it. It doesn't matter how you get there. It's just, it just matters that you get there. And, and so, you know, I think, you know, we can overcome these, some of these things, right? Hey, listen, if, if, if I'm, I've got somebody that needs, you know, some dire, you know, med urgent medical attention and needs to be operated on, well, if I do it, they're going to die because <laughs> I've never gone to school. Right. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's very specialized stuff. Right. And, and, and so I just have, you know, I, I had a desire to get something done. I was focused on it. Uh, and, and I have a mind that, that, um, can figure stuff out. You know, and that was, it was trial and error, do this, do that. And, and that's it. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, education has its, has its place. I think you might find that there's a lot of people that are, that are entrepreneurial that aren't formally educated. And, and, you know, I wasn't educated uh, in business, but I got a lot of experience managing profit and loss statements with my old company. You know, when, when, when I was in senior management with them, and owning my own businesses, you just learn how to do business. I don't, you know, I don't need to go to school to learn how to do business. I think I've learned through experience, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you spoke about like um, the, the process of getting CSA approved there. Um, yeah. What, 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 did, what, what does that involve? Is it just, the, you know, they turn it off and on, make sure it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't explode. Is that... Oh. I really want to get get a lay of what that process was. Basically, you know, I, I built a, a prototype of the unit, and and we talked. I talked with those with the, the companies called QAI, who we deal with, and I had a conversation with those guys. I took it down to them. They looked at it and they went, "That's cool. I wish I would have thought of that." <laughs> yeah, it's and, obvious and the, when when it's done, right? <laughs> Come on, right? I know. <laughs> how many times did that? How many times has that happened in in our lives where it's like oh, I should have thought of that, right? Well, and and the difference between the people that say that and let's say myself is that I thought about it and moved forward and did it, yes. right? I actually took action, and and where there's a lot of people that that have great ideas that that allow maybe fear. Or, or you know the, the fear of failing, or the fear of looking bad, or 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 whatever, uh, get in their way and, and prevent them from going at it. Right. Uh, anyway, that, that's probably the, the difference between you know an entrepreneur and, and someone who's who's not. Yeah. So you were just, talking just, about like the the CSA approval there. Though. Because I'm in the industry, I know a little bit about CSA approvals and and about the products, and so I built it with products that were. Uh, um, already CSA approved, basically. Right, right, right. And so all of the items within my unit were CSA. So it was just a matter of building it, making sure it's operating the way I needed to, uh, and then giving them a sample. They took it away for a couple of months, 
and they, they, they did heat tests on it, load tests on it, temperature tests on it, all kinds of stuff. And after probably, yeah, after a month and a half or so, they said, yep, you're good to go. Here's your, here's your file number. And, uh, you know, if you make any changes, you need to do this and this. And, you know, it, it, was, it was actually quite simple. It was, you know, a little bit of research, a few phone calls, um, and then two months and it was done. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wild. <laughs> it, you just gotta get yeah. started. You just gotta move. It's just gotta move, right? You know, it's one step every day, and that—that's what I've learned. Um, you know, through through my experiences in in personal development, is you know, just keep moving and 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 have faith in yourself, and 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 know that you're you know you're you're good enough, and and you're worthy for all this all the success, right? And it's just a matter of move, 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 move. Never stop moving. You know, look at David Goggins. You talk about someone who's never stopped, right? And and, and always moving. You know, a lot a lot of those guys. They're just to watch what they do and listen to those guys is just invigorating, right? Because yeah. that's what they do. They move, right? Yeah. No, yeah. I, my, I I intend to get into like your personal development journey. Mm. Yeah. So sure, 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 sure. That, I'm going to transition to, we've talked about business. Now let's talk about pleasure in terms of like stick premium cigars. Tobacco is a funny, a funny thing in, in, in Canada. And the challenge that the tobacco industry has is that out of any form of, of smoking, cigars is probably the healthiest. Now that seems kind of odd, right? But typical cigar smokers don't inhale their smoke. You know, so it's not an inhalation thing. It's it's a flavor thing. It's a new like you know you, you hear people talk about cigars and they'll say well, there's you know there's hints of of cedar and uh, you know dark cherries. There's the, the adjectives that people use to describe cigars are, are very and similar as wine, same as wine culture or coffee culture, right? In the premium products, there's not a stitch of chemicals. Even the glue they use for the cigars is a is a, a, a vegetable based glue. Yeah, so it's all natural. Unfortunately, you know, cigars get get wrapped up with cigarettes and vapes, <clears throat> and and they couldn't be more different. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wolf of Young Street podcast. If you derive value from this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. I would love to hear from you as well, so please comment your thoughts down below.